one of the things that's wonderful about this book, which is called The Reconnection, is that it quite often activates people to be able to actually do this work. So let's talk about why do you think that is and what exactly is The Reconnection? Can you explain that in a few words or less, right? Well, The Reconnection is us reconnecting with our original fullness as the spirit that we are, that we exist as in between these physical lifetimes, and it's here for us to learn to reconnect with here during our physical lifetimes. The book, for some reason, seems to activate or bring people into this consciousness, this, this awareness, and into this state of being able to facilitate healings for one another. Um, I think, since I didn't plan consciously um, how that was to happen, I assume it just happens because it is supposed to happen because we are stepping into our evolution here as, hum as human beings, here in this humankind. And therefore, the time is opening up to allow us this now, and we are here to accept it and experience it. How exciting. Do you think that we were, uh, let's see, do you think that the, it's like returning us to being or reconnecting us to being galactic beings or beings of way out there, universal beings? It's allowing us to become more multidimensional beings. And this is a result of a shift that's going on with time at the moment. If you speak with quantum physicists, they explain that time is moving faster, but not, not in a linear fashion as if from point A to point B, but actually in all directions at once. So what time is really doing is opening up and expanding. And as time does this, as it opens up and expands, it encompasses more and more of what has always existed in the universe, but not been here in our existence, because our existence has been the four-dimensional existence that we know today, height, width, depth, and time. Mm -hmm. And as we have existed in that, uh, physicists often represent this as a bubble. So imagine this huge, vast, endless, multidimensional universe. Okay. And then there's this one little bubble in it, and that's been our four-dimensional existence, that everything inside the bubble has been energy, and the bubble containing it has been height, width, depth, and time. But as time expands, our bubble is opening up and expanding. It's encompassing more and more of what's always existed in the universe outside of time, so therefore it's been timeless. Hmm. So you... But it's here for the first time now so that it's new, which is a concept that can tend to royally irritate a lot of the new age people because they want everything to be old so they can claim prior familiarity with it, such as, you know, I remember this from my past life when I was Cleopatra for the 33rd time in Atlantis and Memoria. <laughs> and, you know, sometimes something is just new and isn't that wonderful because we're also here for what's new. Well, that's true. <laughs> you know, so it's not relevant about past lives anyway in this particular subject. You're saying we're opening up to be multidimensional beings. I love that. And what it At this point in time, when time is simultaneous, there no as you step into that multidimensionality, there no longer is anything such as past lives. There's no more deja vu. It's simul vu. You know, these are simultaneous <laughs> like lifetimes that, actually, that yeah. we're tapping into all at once. So uh, what we thought of as past lives, the reason we thought of it that way was because we were viewing it through the illusion of um, a linear existence, past, present, and future. And since we don't need that anymore, we're sort of emerging as a different species, are we not? Mm -hmm. Well, let's go back Absolutely to, <laughs> before we lose everybody, because we're transcending the, the basic earth plane references right now. So before we do that, let's okay. give them some foundation, like how did this start with you? And what on earth is the reconnective healing? Let's do some of the basics for people. Sure. Well, the background of the story is fairly strange and simple. I, um, strange is good. Was a doctor. Strange and simple. Simple to explain and strange at the same time. Hence, strange is simple. Or as some people might put it, simple and strange, or simply strange. <laughs> Take your choice. Um, I was practicing as a doctor of chiropractic for 12 years when um, one night I was awakened in the middle of the night by a very bright light. I opened my eyes to see what it was, and it wasn't anything seemingly spiritual or metaphysical. It was simply the lamp next to my bed that had decided to turn itself on. Now, I had had that lamp for a good, oh, 10 years, and it hadn't selected any other propitious occasion to self-ignite, but <laughs> suddenly there it was. And at the same time, I felt the strong presence of um, someone in my home. So I got up 
rather bravely with a nice can of pepper spray in my Doberman Pinscher and went hunting to see what I could find. And after about 20 minutes or so, I finally decided that it had to have been my imagination and I should go back to sleep, even though it felt as if someone was still there. But that Monday when I went into my office, seven of my patients, independently of one another, offered up, as a matter of fact, insisted that they were feeling people in the room with us while I was working with them, pretty much the same way I had been feeling people in my home. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Were you scared? Strange sounds. (laughs) Um, Well, it it seems as if I should have been. Um, What I really was was in awe of the situation. It was something so broad. It, It was... It, it, I was awestruck by it. Now, awe is an interesting word because awe can be confused with fear because mm-hmm. it's awe of the unknown, and yet sometimes we let ourselves go into fear when we don't know what it is when it's something new. As a matter of fact, I was having this discussion in um, Svat, which is the city where Kabbalah had first begun. I've been you know, there, the yes. It's a Kabbalah. beautiful city. Right. And I was having this discussion with the main Kabbalah rabbi there, and I said, you know, something's always bothered me about about the expression um, that's used in a lot of, um, I would say, Protestant form texts very often, which is God-fearing. And it never made sense to me that someone should be fearing God or that a God would want us to be in, in fear of him or her. And the rabbi explained to me that the word nora which is the word that fear was taken from in that concept, you know, God-fearing, means on one level, on a very basic level, it means something, you know, terrible or something, you know, that could be fearful. But on the level that it's used in the Bible, what it means is not fear. It means awe. Hmm. And that made it all so simple to me because, you know, when you're really truly in a state of awe, you don't know what it is, and you get to choose whether to be in awe or whether to be in fear. Hmm. Awe can be very, very inspiring, can't it? Unlimited. Absolutely. Unlimiting, I would say. Absolutely. So so as as that was happening, as my patients were telling me that they were feeling someone in the room with us, um, I realized this was my 12th year in practice. No one had ever said anything like this to me before. So seven people saying it out of the blue in one day, you would think would have gotten my attention. Yeah. But at the same time, other people are saying to me, I can feel your hands before you touch me, which, of course, I didn't believe. So I said, all right, lie down and close your eyes. And I held my hands several feet to several yards away from these people, and they could tell me where my hand, my palm was facing, right shoulder, left ankle. So it sort of became a game because, well, it was my office, and I could have the games I wanted, and I took this one. And as I would play with this, I would see, first their eyes would begin to rapidly dart back and forth and back and forth, and then tiny little muscles in their face would begin to ripple, little independent muscles that we couldn't move intentionally. They're so small, and they would ripple along the forehead, pulling at the eyebrows, and they would um, ripple around the, the chin, pulling at the lips, and, and then larger muscles would come into play, and fingers would move, and feet would move, and um, when they would open their eyes, they would start to tell me that they were seeing colors that they had never seen before, lights colored lights and white lights, and that they were smelling fragrances of flowers that they had never before smelled. And at the same time, they started reporting healings, real healings. They were getting up out of wheelchairs, some of them. Others were were, um, telling me that um, they regained their hearing or their their vision. Parents and doctors uh, were calling me and saying, you know, what what, what happened? What did you do? uh, This child with cerebral palsy or that child with epilepsy is able to walk and run and play and speak normally and not require medication any longer, no more seizures. What did you do? What did you do? And I kept saying, I didn't do anything and don't tell anybody, which, of course, went over about as big as Nancy Reagan just trying to say no to drugs. (laughs) Could you tell me, could you actually feel anything happening through you or around you? Yes. You could. I could feel strange sensations in my hands and then in my body, but um, no idea what the different sensations meant. Um, As a matter of fact, what I teach today is it's not what you're feeling, it's that you allow yourself to be feeling something. It's not attributing that this sensation must mean this and this feeling here must mean that because that's when we limit ourselves trying to explain things. I mean, how and why are two of the most, yeah, how and why are two of the most disempowering questions that we can ask, but when we're willing to observe without judgment, without our ego assigning meaning, just observe without judgment, we find that our reward is that we get to witness yet greater and greater healings and healing manifestations. 
So, so what did you do with all this then? I mean, how did you leap into the reconnection and the book and the amazing work you're doing all over the world? Well, as people started reporting healing, more and more people would come to me and say, teach this. And I said, teach it. You've got to be nuts. How do you teach something like this? I'm standing there waving my hands in the air, looking like a fool. So you go outside, wave your hands in the air, let me know what your neighbors have to say about it. <laughs> and yet I'd get phone call after phone call from my patients saying they drove up to their house, no automatic garage door opened before they hit the button, or they walked inside, <laughs> their lamp or their TV started turning on and off and on and off. They felt sensations in their hands. They would hold their hands by someone in their family, and suddenly the grandfather could walk in after the stroke, and the uncle regained the use of his hearing or speech. And we began to find that once you interact with this, what science says is a new, much vastly more comprehensive spectrum of healing than they've ever witnessed here on the planet before. Once we interact with this, it changes us. We become changed in a certain way that um, allows us to facilitate healings for others as well as to facilitate our own healing. So many studies have been shown now, years later, that specifically with reconnective healing, it changes your DNA. It restructures, or what I say, it reconnects the DNA. Uh, and um, some new studies just came out with the Russian Olympic athletes, where we took 40 Russian Olympic athletes, and um, what we did was we um, took a control group and the main group, and we let the main group experience reconnective healing, and the control group we let experience energy healing. And 100% of the people in the control group tested 10 days later showed dramatic, uh, indescribably, indescribably dramatic changes in their red blood cells, their white blood cells, their humoral levels, and their emotional states, all far for the better. 0% in the control group that had energy healing experience. How, how often did they have reconnective healing? <clears throat> Once. One session, one time, and then they were measured 10 days later. Wow. So, so it, it shows that it sustains without having to come back and do again and again and again. That's one of the benefits. One of the things that makes reconnected healing so unique is that the healing tends to be fairly instantaneous, and they tend to last for the person's lifetime. Hmm. So let's go back to you having some uh, questions and scratching your head and not wanting to wave your hands in public and so on. And then all of a sudden you did a book or you started teaching, or where was the pole vaulting in that area? Well, at some point, as more people asked me to talk about it, I realized that I, I guess I could tell the story of it and allow people to feel it. And as I did that, um, and I allowed them to feel it, I showed them how I played with it. I would release, you know, group after group of um, new healers onto an unsuspecting planet. And boy, did I get phone calls. <laughs> Matter of fact, at the time, I didn't even have a computer, but there were so many phone calls to handle, I had to go out and get a computer and learn how to use it, which was a fear of its own I had to overcome, but I did. And um, as that picked up, I, it got to a point, I'm sorry, I don't know what that is, but let's try it this way. As that picked up, it got to a point where there were so many people coming in for healing and so much television that I would turn my chiropractic practice over to another doctor, and then if I just did the doctor run the practice down, and I would go back into the chiropractic practice to bring it back up again, and then I'd turn it over to another doctor, and I'd run it into the ground, and I kept repeating this pattern until finally I signed it over and gave it away with my blessings, and um, someone heard me speak and sent in a copy of me speaking to Hay House book publishers, and they contacted me and asked me if I would write a book, which... I said that I would, having no idea how to write a book, but I thought, you know, you could just get a ghostwriter and talk to them and have a book come about. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> That's not the process. Now, let me tell you, for me to have to organize my mind or my thinking to write a book is more of a hurdle than I can possibly explain. I mean, I used to get um, dizzy just walking into a library and seeing all those books staring at me. I've read approximately three books in my entire life, you know, and one I'm still coloring. I, I, so, um, <laughs> are you st do you have ADD or did you have ADD as a child? Oh, probably. The, the reason I ask that is because I'm wondering if these new frequencies are more aligned with, um, if ADD is kind of a reference that we're changing as a species and we'll have more of a rapport with uh, high frequencies. I don't know. I'm just questioning. That. It may well be. I don't really know. It, it, it may well be. But I will tell you what I did was I hired a ghostwriter. I gave them lots of material to listen to and show them printed material and did interviews with him and let him interview my parents and other people who had healings. And was he really I got a ghost? Hmm? Was he was really? He really a ghost? No, but his name was Casper. <laughs> Wonderful. And, 
And I gave him all these materials, and he sent back to me this manuscript, which had some truth in it and some things that he just manufactured, I don't know from where. So I forced myself to sit down and go through the whole thing and say, keep this part, this is wrong, get rid of this, keep this, this is wrong, get rid of that. And just as I was ready to send it to him, a new form of it would show up, more expansive, where he lost some of the good things, expanded upon some of the things that weren't right to begin with, so I started fixing that one. All I can tell you is that at one point, I had about seven different versions of this book all spread out on my dining room table. Oh. I was trying to figure out which ones to correct and how to put the right stuff back, and then finally, That's a nightmare. I became so frustrated by that it was that I paid him the rest of his money to go away. And then I was forced <laughs> with facing the biggest fear in my life, having to organize and write a book. Hmm. So um, I sat there and I had a deadline. I remember it was going to be um, about Christmas or New Year's of that year. And I worked and worked and worked and got it to be as good as I could get it, which didn't satisfy me because it wasn't what I thought was the best that it really could be, but I just didn't know what to do and how to do with it. And, and I called the um, publisher, the editor, and I said, well, all right, it's as good as I can do it right now. I guess I'll give it to you. And she said to me, well, I'm actually going to be too busy to read it for the next week, so we want to keep it for one more week to refine it. Go ahead. And somewhere during that week, I mean, I was living in my bed. I, mean, I would sit up, I'd be on the computer until I couldn't type anymore. I'd lie back, I'd go to sleep, I'd sit up, I'd start again. Somewhere in that week, it was like, remember um, record albums? It was like the needle hitting the groove in the album, and it started to flow, and it started to flow. And at the end of that week, I called her up, and I said, well, the good news is, is I found the book. The bad news for you is, is you can't have it yet, because now I know how to fix it, and you can't have it until I've got it just right. Oh. <laughs> and about a month later, I got it just where I wanted it. I sent it off with my blessings. I haven't read it since, but every six months or so, I'll crack a copy of the book open. I'll read a sentence or two at random, and I'll think, well, that's pretty good. I can't believe I wrote that. <laughs> <laughs> it's got wonderful life in it and lots and lots of expression that, that help you grow, I think. So, oh, well, thank you. Yeah, that book has just zinged through a lot of cultures, as you've already said. So tell the people, uh, I don't know if we can explain this, but what are these frequencies and how do you use them and how do healers use them? Well, it's a bandwidth that takes us beyond the energy. Remember we talked about uh, our four-dimensional bubble. Right. Uh, and everything inside of our existence here, just as we had always been taught, has been energy. And so our energy healing techniques have allowed us to focus in on the portions or subsets of that energy. And we've given them names, you know, Reiki, Jirai, Jinshin, Shigong, Mahjong, Beijing, Alpha, Beta, Delta, Gamma, you know. But the first step in getting beyond that is for us to learn to put down the, shall we say, the telescope of focus. You know, it's like studying the sky, studying the heavens. You know, we, we look at one small section with a telescope, another with a telescope, another with a telescope, but at a certain point in time after we've understood what's going on in those little small subsets of sky, comes time for us to put down the telescope so we can understand the sky itself. And so our first step is to let go of and transcend the techniques so we can access the fullness of energy. Hmm. But as a reward for doing that, as we step into this bubble of the timeless expansion, the bubble expands further and further out, and we encompass not just energy any longer, but a spectrum comprised, the researchers explain, of energy, light, and information, aspects of energy, light, and information that we haven't seen here on the Earth before that turn the laws of physics upside down and inside out. For instance, energy gets weaker with distance. This becomes stronger with distance. They did measurements on what happens in the healing seminar rooms and found that the level of free energy that steps into the healing rooms with reconnective healing is something they've never seen with energy healing techniques, and they think that the only way they could possibly even begin to attempt to reproduce it would be if they raised the temperature of the room to get this over 300 degrees Celsius, which is the equivalent to approximately 575 degrees Fahrenheit. Wow. A little uncomfortable maybe, huh? <laughs> it would be, but it's anything but uncomfortable. It is fascinatingly comfortable. It is, it is seductively comfortable in, in the way that it takes you off and out into this instant state of calm, aware bliss. Well, I can remember coming out and feeling uh, kind of like electrical and high and not necessarily comfortable driving in the traffic. <laughs> For a while, anyway. Really? You were probably driving better than you ever did. Oh, that's probably true, but not so conscious of the weight of it all, I suppose. Eh? 
Oh, well, that's true, which makes it even better, doesn't it? Listen, yes, it does. So you, know you're not, you know you know how to drive the first time that you pull up in front of where you were going and suddenly realize that you don't remember getting there. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, so what, what you're saying light and information, I love that. So tell people what that really means. Where does the information come from? What is the information? It's not so linear of a word, information that we can describe. It's not like, you know, the square root of, you know, 144 is. It's information that's exchanged on a level that's largely not conscious, although a very huge percentage of the people gain very deep conscious insights as well. So the, the light that is seen here or that is measured here is light that we haven't experienced or seen here before either. And, and they feel that the reason that the light plays such an important role in the healing has to do with, well, for starters, um, Dr. William Tiller, who's Professor Emeritus from Stanford University, is, um, you know, he's published uh, at least a dozen or so books and, and several hundred papers. Um, he's known, among other things, for what's called the Tiller-Einstein model of negative entropy. And um, I know that sounds very complicated, but all we really have to do is understand entropy. Entropy means the natural tendency for things to break down, for things to degenerate or, or, or to fall apart. Hmm. But you see, um, what happens is that's a natural process of aging, this concept of entropy. And so as that takes place, um, it's our tendency to break down and age. And the thing that speeds up this entropy or this aging process, whether it's in human beings or machinery or anything else, um, what, what enhances it or makes it greater, the entropy, is speed. The faster things move, the faster the molecules move, the faster the items move, the more the entropy, the more the breaking down, the aging, and the degeneration. It's like it but wears itself out. Dr. Right. But what Dr. Tiller um, is famous for is, as I said, is called the Tiller Einstein model of negative entropy, which sounds complicated, and it's really simple. Tiller means Dr. Tiller. Einstein means Albert Einstein. Model means, well, hey, it's a model. And negative entropy means the opposite of entropy. In other words, once we reach the speed of light, entropy reverses itself. Degeneration becomes regeneration. Disorganization becomes reorganization. Dis-ease becomes healing or ease. And so once we reach that speed of light, we begin our natural regeneration process. This level, and we, we're discovered today, we're discovering today speeds much faster than light, which used to be thought of as impossible. And this is where the regeneration begins in this new spectrum of healing, because the body doesn't heal the way we were taught. We were taught that the body heals through chemicals. It was called the chemical or the biochemical model. We know today that the body heals through Energy, frequency, vibration, resonance, information that is carried within this and this light. So this is part of understanding the new level of healing. But you see, a lot of things don't function the way we were taught. The brain doesn't function the way we were taught that it functioned. Remember those models of the brain we used to see oh, yeah. where there were little circles all over different areas of it and said this part of the brain is speech and this part is memory and this part is learning and this part is this and that. Well, we know today from... Um, the work of um, several people out there today, um, doctors Lashley and um, let me see, Carl Lashley and Carl Pribram and others, that that model is no longer true. We know today that the information is diffused throughout our brain, it's spread throughout our brain, it's not just in tiny little areas waiting to be plucked out, and that we also access information from this scientifically named field that used to be called the etheric field, now science calls it zero point field. We access information from that zero point field. And once we do, well, we're all in this field all along anyway. I mean, the fact is we're all just listening to this information as it comes along. For example, um, when you think of someone that you haven't thought of for 15 years and 15 minutes, the phone rings, um, then you can simply you know, know that you're accessing that field. When children are on a school bus, you know, and one child falls asleep and another child stares at that child until they wake up, we're accessing that field. So people who are geniuses, people who are psychics, people who are healers, it's nothing all really that mysterious. They're just listening, paying attention to that field more naturally and without second-guessing the information as it comes in. 
So you said also, uh, there's a number of things here. This is a big, exciting conversation for me. But there are a number of things you say in your book, which is uh, the healer, you can't teach people how to be healers. I'm, I'm thinking that our ability to be unlimited, you're saying if we receive, we can receive the frequencies that will heal us or expand our potential, and that will that will be the healing force. Is that it? Yeah, you see, you, yes. In, in a way, it's an evolutionary force because... It, it does, as we've, as we've seen now in, in four different very large research studies and the fifth international study um, being coordinated right now, we've seen that this work restructures, or as I say, reconnects the DNA, which functions in a certain way for us, well, in many ways, but in a certain way, it tends to function like software. For instance, how does your computer work? You've got this piece of computer hardware, this metal box in front of you, which by itself does nothing until you put a software program into it. Right. Then once you do, you're able to access information from within the computer, and you're able to access information from that Internet field out there somewhere. If we um, upgrade the software, we get better information from within the computer and better access to that Internet field out there somewhere. So what if our brains are our hardware, and what if our DNA is our software. Hmm. And what if we are doing what the research studies are now confirming that we are doing, which is bringing about an upgrade of the DNA? And what we are actually doing when we learn to access this work, what we're giving and what we're, we are receiving at the same time, in a sense, is a human software upgrade that allows better access to the information within the brain and more comprehensive access to that multidimensional field, that zero-point field in which we exist. So it is our evolution. It's only one tiny, tiny, tiny little part of it that's about physical healings, but everyone runs for the physical healings because they're so excited that they wouldn't know yet, maybe in the beginning, that they should be excited if we hung out a, sh a sign that said, come get your DNA reconnected here. <laughs> oh, I would be. Well, I still go back to the ADD thing. I think our children are showing us, or I think our society is showing us, that there is a change trying to happen in our in our beingness isn't isn't it oh well there definitely is that and we are stepping into this time of change now a lot of people want to connect this to 2012 and 2012 may well be a stepping point for us but realize that it's not the first stepping point and it won't be the last stepping point i mean i don't think any of us are going to wake up on um, december 22nd 2012 uh, 11 11 a.m and suddenly peek under the bed sheets and scream because we're invisible. I mean, we might <laughs> scream for another reason, but that'll be a different interview. <laughs> right here, um, I don't know that we'll notice the difference that next day or the next week or, you know, it might be three years or 12 years or a couple dozen years when we'll look back and say, look at this huge overall shift in human consciousness that's been happening no, I agree around with you. this time change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, remember the... Do you remember what it was they used to call the harmonic convergence yes, that came around I do, yes. in 1987? That was one of the jumps in time that we went through. There was a, another one that took place around November of 2002. 2012 will, I'm sure, be another jump. But by the time we see and recognize what form that jump in our consciousness and our human evolution has taken, we'll already be focusing on when the next one is coming. Oh, that's probably true. So what do you see as humanity like the work you're doing for example is helping people i would say wake up to a multi-dimensional potential right and 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 yes. it, it in turn becomes contagious doesn't it that's the word that lynn mctaggart uses she's the author of the field and of the bond yeah. and the intention experiment mm -hmm. she says that um that reconnective healing is contagious or infectious i said gee lynn i wish you could use other words but <laughs> <laughs> well what i want to say is like we do ignite people share fields however you want to say it and we do ignite one another's evolution by or right. or devolution i suppose you know so that's kind well, of well that's why when you were saying you can't teach healing uh, you were right i said that all the time you can't teach healing what happens is is that the change that we go through um from interacting with it gifts us with the abilities but then the teaching portion of it is to teach you how to utilize it for instance um when I give seminars, I'm only giving, I think, one more seminar in the United States this year, which is going to be December, the first weekend in December in Miami. I, I think that's December 3, 4, 5 or something like that. Mm -hmm. And um, and people sign up on your website? 
Sure, they can go to, oh, it's December 2, 3, and 4. Yeah, um, yeah, you can go to the website. It's the same as the book. The book title is The Reconnection, Heal Others, Heal Yourself, and the website is www.thereconnection.com. And uh, so we're giving one more in the U.S. The rest are, I'm, I'm doing Italy next week. I'm in Germany right now. I'll be in, um, after Miami, I'll be in Buenos Aires. But the one in Miami, for example, on that Friday night, December 2nd, what will happen is, I'll give a three-hour presentation where we talk about the history of the work, the theory of the work, the philosophy behind it. We'll bring up some volunteers from the audience so we can give live demonstrations on the healings, um, maybe on you or on somebody that you might know if you're there. And then we also give everyone an opportunity to feel this in your hands. But Saturday and Sunday, December 3rd and 4th, that is different. That's a real working seminar, a learning working seminar. What that means is don't come if you think we're all going to sit around and hold hands home and sing Kumbaya, my Lord, because it really won't happen that way. Um, Darn. There's a stage in the center. No, no, won't do, you'll, you'll miss the rendition of that one. Um, there's a stage in the center of the room. There's chairs on one side and massage tables on the other. And what happens is, is while you're in your chairs, we'll demonstrate a level of the work from the stage and discuss it. Then we'll all go to the massage tables in groups of either two or four. I will walk around to each table, so will our internationally trained team of teaching assistants, and the Miami seminar will be simultaneously translated into Spanish to make it more accessible for people. And I'll take your hand, and oh, we'll take your hand and we'll say, now, notice what you feel when you're here, and as you feel the sensation, look at how the person's body responds, and you might start to see their eyes rapidly dart back and forth and back and forth, show you how to feel a different sensation somewhere else, and now watch their body, and you'll see their fingers move or their feet move, and you start to recognize that hmm, when I'm here, I feel this, and I see that. When I'm here, I feel this, and I see that. And you start to recognize that you have a distinct role in this healing interaction. Then we go back to the tables, talk about what we just did, discuss the philosophy a little more, demonstrate the next level, and go back to the massage tables once again. And as this process continues, well, this process continues throughout the course of the weekend. But by the end of that weekend, for example, in Miami, by that Sunday, December 4th, I can pretty much make you two promises which are A, you will be able to do anything and everything in the way of healing that I can do. And B, you will be able to do anything and everything in the way of healing that any human being anywhere on this planet can do, whether they were raised by monks in a cave in a mountaintop in Tibet or whether they <laughs> created their own energy healing techniques or you know whether they moved to a church deep in Brazil and changed their last name from the perfectly good ones their parents gave them to of God. It doesn't matter. It simply does not matter the story. It only matters our willingness to transcend the story. And it's also a very so vigorous uh, seminar. I've attended, uh, I think, three, four, and they're very wonderful, very, very busy, and learn a lot. I love Well, them. thank you. Thank you for that. <laughs> and that's my intention, that by the time you complete that seminar, by the time you complete that seminar, you are able to facilitate any level of healing that any human being can. Now, when you say facilitate, what you're saying really is conducting these frequencies. Is, it, is that what you're saying? You'll be able, right. But what I mean is not just this. I mean, you, you learn to become the observer and the observed, to observe without judgment. But as you interact with these, what you do is you bring a level of balance into the equation. The person returns to their natural vibration of light, for example, where anything denser than light, which tends to include pretty much most health challenges, has pretty much nothing else left to hold on to. So as appropriate for that person, those health challenges, those densities simply fall away and the person returns to a state of balanced health. Hmm. So can you help us with aging? <laughs> what makes you think that aging is not health? Well, that's a good point, isn't it? In other words, if we don't age and if we live forever, then we cheat ourselves out of the lessons learned by going through our various um, lifetimes. But if we're moving into the dimensionality where we don't need to do many lifetimes, is that what you said? No. What I said is if we stop the aging process and we live forever and we cheat ourselves out of the lessons of that we go through by going through these various lifetimes that we pass through in different forms and different ways. The experience we get from going through one lifetime as a male is different than the one we get going through as a female. The one we go through as someone who has a naturally happy face is different from the one that someone goes through who has a face that people are always saying, what's wrong, why don't you smile? I mean, all these 
different things with different packages we show up the way that we experience life is very important so and i agree with you entirely so real healing is what as you've you've kind of described it in the book where we are beings uh in some kind of stasis with the universe where we are in in being and in existence with the universe rather than in resistance or in is, is that right you had an explanation i tried to find it before we started this but i couldn't find it We'll say what you think it is again, and I'll see if I okay, remember it. Okay, so um, in in he, what you I think I remember you saying was that it is ultimately healing for us to be in the consciousness of beingness in harmony or in receptivity or in expression of the universe, rather than of trying to decide who we are, how to be uh, resisting uh, because of other experiences and so on. I don't know how you put it, but it was very eloquent. I don't know how I put it either, but you're putting it very nicely. <laughs> But, but my feeling is if we're an evolving being, then letting go of our drives and our defenses and all that sort of stuff is part of the healing process, is it not? Yes, absolutely. Of course it is. As a matter of fact, part of that is the release. Part of that is the release of ego. For example, um, here. Let me. I, I'm working on a second book right now. Let me read you a little excerpt from it, and we'll see if it makes sense. Oh, I love that. Okay. There's a lot that needs to be said in various ways. We understand ourselves in a limited fashion, and we need to carry this understanding as a life process. It is the unveiling of a multifaceted force within our life. We need to peel away the exterior so that that internal being shines through to those we come in contact with. This eternal soul that resides within our framework is being covered up in many ways by our fears. And in your work as a healer, that is what you need to do to unveil your soul. It is not a simple process, and this stripping away of ego is an internal process. This selflessness that must shine through the being that can reach in without interference from various mindsets. Once that pure force shines through without it being refracted by various mindsets, it will flow in a more direct manner. Once you allow your soul, that egoless purity, to come through, that is almost a common denominator in that it has the ability to automatically fuse with the frequency of the person you're coming into contact with. So your job in this process is to strip away the defense, strip away the mind, strip away the control mechanisms that you have in this plane. Let them go. Let them be a part of an exterior that has nothing to do with you and present that soul in the room. It will automatically do the work. That energy is the common, universal language of the cosmos. It is understood immediately and is felt intrinsically. Wonderful. Oh, I love that. So this uh, work has put you through a lot of growth too, hasn't it? Oh, it sure has. <laughs> <laughs> has it been like a steady kind of growth? How do you feel now compared to 20 years ago when you started? I think it was 20, wasn't it? No, not quite. Don't age me. Um, <laughs> let's see. But if you go, if you age faster than the speed of light, doesn't, don't we go the other direction? We regenerate, right? Apparently. Yeah. Apparently we do. All right. In which case, then this is up past my bedtime. I have to go to sleep because it's almost 9 o'clock here. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know that I'm a different person. I don't exactly know how. I don't know who I was. I know that there are parts of the old me that I still have and parts that have changed. I know there are parts of the old me I have that I wish I didn't have and parts that I have that I'm glad I do have. You know, um, geez, it's a, it's a really difficult question because how, if I said to you, how are you different now than you were 15 or 20 years ago, you know, how can you answer that question? Or can you? I guess you can't, but there's something about, and I'll circle around a little bit, reconnective healing, you're not necessarily supposed to uh, apply it to someone's particular problem, right? There has to be kind Correct. of, uh, and, and I'm kind of likening it to what you read about the ego is like, Stepping away from control of the problem, response to the problem, reaction to the problem. You see, energy, energy healing techniques feed us to do those things, and that's part of what we're here to grow out of. Okay. We haven't had a model in the healing world of how to function, so we have taken on the medical model. Mm -hmm. Medical model means you diagnose and determine the problem, and then you do something to fix the problem as best as you can understand how to fix it, as best as you can understand what the problem is to begin with. You know, diagnosis, die from the Greek meaning to, or from the Latin meaning to, 
Yeah, agnosis from the Greek, meaning agnostic or don't know. So there you have it, two people who don't know, but, you know, <laughs> there we go with diagnosis anyway. And so uh, the, way this ego shows up in the, really, the way this ego shows up in the healing world is that we're always looking to figure out the problem because it does feed our ego to say, look, I found the problem. I'm a medical intuitive, or my guide told me just where to go, or I did the muscle testing, or I, 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 me, me, me. And then we go and we try to fix what we're able to understand according to the limitations of our conscious human educated mind. So we try to change the chakra spins to make them all go clockwise or counterclockwise, or we, we remove colors from you know the energy fields that don't belong there and change the colors to what we think should be but yet in reality all these changes that are going on in that system are truly manifestations of the intelligence of the universe that are there for us to witness to learn from because i mean we see this in the human body if someone is injured you know what happens there's pain there's swelling the color changes red blood cells wash away the debris um, new um, nutrient fluids come to support the area to give it what it needs to heal and also to limit its movement so it's swollen or it's dense in that area. We watch the tissue colors change during the week. This is all the normal intelligent design of the human body. So if we're looking at these things off the body and we see shockers spinning in different directions and we correct them, we have to think, wait a minute, what makes us think that some of them clockwise and some of them counterclockwise are any less intelligent than the way the body redirects blood and other fluids? Or when we try to shift colors around in the auras, what makes us think those color shifts are any less intelligent than the color shifts that we see in the human tissue during the healing process? Or when we remove the density, what makes us think that density doesn't belong there? It's fine, we remove the density and everything flows freely again, but the point is, Maybe that density was like that fluid or that swelling protecting the joint and allowing it to regenerate. In other words, when we start moving all those things around to where we think they belong, what we're really saying is, thanks a lot, God. You've done a really wonderful job with most of the universe up until now. But look, <laughs> you missed these spots. Please let me fix them for you. By the way, please keep my pink business card with the rainbows and the fairies on it in case I can help you again. I'd love to stay in chat. I only have enough time to run home and email everyone and let them know what I had just done for you and still make it to the class that I'm teaching tonight on how to transcend your ego. By the way, God, you might want to come. There's always something for everyone to learn. <laughs> so quickly, before we run out of time, what's the difference between reconnective healing and the reconnection? Oh, you'll never do that quickly, but as quickly as I can figure out how to do it. Well, just a thumbnail then. <laughs> we are, right. The reconnection is a two-day process that is basically designed to throw you onto your life course maybe even faster than you think you're ready to jump onto it. In. And it's really a phenomenal way your life seems to change from that. And it's about reconnecting. And some degree of healing happens in it, of course. Reconnective healing, the focus is on healing and some degree of reconnecting and throwing yourself onto your life course takes place. So it's really a question of which is the dominant factor in it. Well, and it has, it has to do with the lines that we have that receive those frequencies, doesn't it? It ties us into the meridian lines. It ties our meridian lines and our bodies into the grid lines on the planet, which extend out and tie us in and connect us with the other stars and planets and the dimensions and space in between. But you know what? If you go on to www.thereconnection.com, you can see descriptions between the two that can explain it a little bit better than I can do in, you know, in just like the final minute of a radio interview. Yes. <laughs> so it's on TheReconnection.com. Excellent, excellent. So people who want to catch up with you, and I really think these are wonderful, wonderful. The Reconnective Healing is a wonderful, wonderful program. So they can do that with you next weekend if they're in the States, in, in Florida, right? Well, in Miami. Um, they can do that Not the next very weekend, first two weekends. weekend. Yeah. Yeah, they can do it next weekend with me, but they'll have to be in Riccioni, Italy. Oh. Otherwise, you have to wait two weekends, and then I'll be in Miami, or three weekends, weekends, and I will be in Buenos Aires. Wonderful. Are you going to work with the Italian government? And... Um, it's not planned on this visit, although I was just um, invited to be working with the Hungarian government and yeah. interact there, so I had my first meeting with them um, uh, a week and a half ago. Wonderful. Well, maybe you could do some reconnection with the Congress here. <laughs> I've been thinking about that for a long time. Let I'll me tell you. you. Have. <laughs> wish I did, but I but I don't have the answers either. I just wish the Republicans and the Democrats would stop fighting about like children and trying to see who can win over whose thing and 
why they will penalize one for something and not hold their own people to the same standard. And I wish instead they would turn their focus over towards what's best for the country, but I don't have an opinion on the subject. <laughs> well, I want to tell everybody that if you go onto the website, thereconnection.com, there's a lot of stories about people who have experienced wonderful healings. It's a lot about how it works and where you can find Eric next. And I thank you so much. It's been very interesting, and I'd love to pick your brain more. And I know you must have grown tremendously sharing this energy and light with so many people. I'm sure I've grown just from the interview. <laughs> we grow from everything. That's right. But thank you. It's been an honor and a pleasure to be on your show. And with you, Eric. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night. That was Eric Pearl, Dr. Eric Pearl, with his groundbreaking The Reconnection, a great book, Heal Others and Heal Yourself. It's not only a great book, Eric has taken this kind of healing information all over the world, so check it out, thereconnection.com. This is Veronica Antwistle saying thank you so much for listening. If you have feedback on this show or suggestions for guests for others, or if you'd like a session with me, Veronica at veronicaentwistle.com. No H in Entwistle, that's veronica at veronicaentwistle.com. Good night, and again, thank you for listening.